Oh, I hear you. But but see, you, f- f- listen. Thank you very much. Go, go ahead. Back to duty. I, I, there's two theories regarding the end of life. One is that as a ghost, you you continue to do whatever you did at the moment of death. You know, if that's a suicide, then you keep doing that. If it's um, if you were an invalid in a wheelchair, then you keep going up and down that elevator. And so is it a tape loop? Is it just sort of a lingering memory? Or in fact, is George the person in that wheelchair in some other dimension affecting this dimension, doing what he did during the latter years of his life, just going up and down in that elevator? It suggests some rather disturbing things about death, doesn't it? Wildcard line, you're on the air. Ghost goes to AM. Hi. Hello. Going once. Going twice. Gone. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Ghost goes to AM. Hello. Hello. Is it me? Yes, it is. Ah, this is Daryl from Missouri. Hello, Daryl. Hey, how's it going? Uh, uh, pretty well, thank good, you. Good. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see if I can tell this story short and not ramble as I tend to do. Okay. All right. Thanks for uh, the warning. All right. So, uh, uh, my dad, he was... Uh, kind of obsessed with death, and um, huh. he passed away January 31st of 1981. And about two months after that, I had a dream about him, and um, in the dream, you know, it was very vivid. I told him that he had died, and he didn't know, and and all this, and whatever, and he told me that, that he could come back any time I really needed him. So that was the dream and whatever, and so then, like, ten years later, uh, some things were going on, and I was feeling very depressed about silly stuff and whatever, and uh, I just had this feeling like somebody was tapping me on the shoulder. I just had this constant feeling like somebody was trying to tell me something, tapping me on the shoulder, whatever. Right. right. And uh, so I'm headed home one night. I work second shift, and it's like 3 o'clock in the morning, and I lived way out in the middle of nowhere, and uh, I'm going down the road, and uh, I'm just feeling very frustrated, and I'm doing about 100 miles an hour going down this road, this back road in the middle of nowhere, and I just let go of the steering wheel, and I just threw my hands up in the air, and I go, what? Because I just had this feeling like somebody was trying to tell me something, and I just wasn't getting it or, or whatever. At, a, at 100 miles an hour, you yes. throw your hands off the wheel and say, what? Yes. Uh-huh. And coincidentally, I just happened to be passing a, a real old cemetery right at that point in time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So anyway, all I can say is that all of a sudden I just got this intense feeling like the only way I can describe it is like if you were a little pocket transistor radio and you had the antenna up and you touched your antenna to the transmitter. Just like the ultimate hum, overload, squeal, feedback, whatever, and the hair stood up on the back of my neck and... I guess I let off the gas and grabbed the steering wheel. I'm not really conscious of that at that point. (laughs) And I'm only like five miles from home. I should have been home in like five minutes. Yeah. And and I just got this, and I just heard him. And he started talking to me, and he's telling me, you know, I just wanted to let you know, I wanted to prepare you that all this stuff is going to happen to you, all this bad stuff, and I just wanted to prepare you for, you know, whatever. And he said, you know, your mom's going to get sick, and she's going to die, and you're going to get laid off from your job, and you're going to get divorced, and wow. blah, 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 blah. And he just starts telling me all this stuff. And... Um, and you you knew this was your dad. Yeah. Yeah. And, but, you know, it's like I was hearing it in my head or whatever. So Gee, you hear from I, the grave with just nothing but bad news. Yeah. So I turned down the gravel road, and the gravel road is like a mile completely straight right to my house. And so I turned down the gravel road, and I'm just like coasting down the gravel road, and he's just telling me all this stuff. And I just, I'm, I'm afraid to look, but I look to my right, and I can see him sitting in the seat beside me. And he's like, it looks just like him, but he's like translucent and and kind of bluish gray color or whatever, you know. And yes. but, but it's like when I look straight ahead, I can see him like clearly out of the corner of my eye. But when I look straight at him, he's like not quite as clear. Uh-huh. And so I'm just coasting down the gravel road and uh, he's telling me, you know, well, this, that and the other. And I'm and it's like as soon as I can think of a question, the answer is already there. And he's, it's like I'm a computer downloading information or whatever. And so I'm coasting down this girl road, 
And, uh, like, one of the things I was stressing out about was the brakes were bad on my truck, and I was like, oh, there's snow on the ground. It's January. I'm going to have to get out there, you know. And he goes, well, why don't you go up there to the house, to our old house in the garage and build a wood fire and do it up there in the garage? And I'm like, I didn't even think of that. What, you know, what's wrong with me? And so I get right down there, and as soon as I get to the pond right in front of our house, there's this little pond. He's telling me all this stuff, and then he's gone, instantly gone. And so I... I pull up to the back of the house, and my wife, ex-wife now, comes running out the door. She goes, are you all right? Are you all right? Are you all right? And I go, yeah, why? And I'm just crying, you know. And she goes, because I was sitting in the kitchen watching out the window, and the whole time you were coming down the gravel road, there was this bright white light above the top of your truck, and I thought it was a UFO, and I thought it was going to beam you up or something. Oh, really? Because right when you got to the pond, it disappeared. Uh, oh, oh, really? Yeah. Uh, and I'm so, like, oh, no. I said, no, it wasn't your fault. That was dad. <laughs> and you did just say former wife. So uh, yeah. I assume the rest of what he said, including the divorce, all came true. Yeah. My mom died two years later, uh, three years later. I was laid off three years later. And your uh, divorce. I was divorced nine years later. Whew. Well, maybe Dan will be back with some good news. <laughs> you, you could certainly use some. Well, all hey, right. But, but the warning is at least worth it, you know. Uh, well, I, I guess so. Um, yeah. I, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. So there's a, there's one of just plain outright contact, uh, just straight on contact in a conversation. And it, it here's another thing I wonder about. Assuming that we make it to the other side in the manner suggested by all of these stories, how hard is it to manifest ourselves in the way, for example, that man did to his son? How hard is that? What energy does that take? In what manner is that done? But there's so many of them. There's got to be some truth to all of this. At the bottom of all of these stories, there's a lesson, and that lesson is that life doesn't end with the physical. Not if you're, not if you're listening. It just doesn't. There's something else the consciousness and who we are continue in some way or another. Uh, West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Hi. What is your name, please? Uh, my name's Peter. Okay, Peter. Uh, where are you? Uh, I'm in San Diego. Okay, far away. Well, I uh, I almost didn't tell this story because, uh, but then uh, when your bumper music came on, when White Bird came on, I figured that was a sign, so I had to I had to keep going with the story. That uh, that piece of music is a sign, my friend. That's why I play Well, uh, you'll understand why. All right. Uh, about 20 years ago, I was uh, I was very, very deeply in love with somebody, but um, uh, it just it couldn't happen. And uh, I... She belonged to another? Uh, he belonged to another. He belonged to another. Okay. Um, but I... Tried to stay in touch every couple of months and um, give a call. And um, then one time when I called, I was told that he had died. And um, they'd had the funeral and everything, and I hadn't known anything about it. But I found out where he was buried, and I went up there. Um, it was a, a small uh, town. It was a large cemetery, but a, in a small town. Mm-hmm. And I, it was on a, a late on a Saturday afternoon in the fall, and, and there was nobody there, and I had no idea where to find his grave, so I just started looking. And sure. it, was, it was a very large cemetery, uh, maybe 100 yards wide, maybe 300 yards long, ringed by a uh, forest. And there was an old section where there was stand-up headstones, and then there was a new section that had had the brass plaques flat on the ground. Well, they pack them in, you know. I mean, yeah. not not a lot of the residents complain. So they <laughs> yeah. pack them in. So and I I started just kind of wandering aimlessly around, hoping that maybe <clears throat> maybe he was in a uh, in a family plot in the old section, where there'd be a, a stand up headstone where I could see the family name. But um, then it. it I couldn't find him, and it started to get late in the afternoon, and the sun started to go down, and I started to think I, I wasn't going to be able to find him. And I was on the far side uh, near the woods, and um, all of a sudden this bird flies out of the trees, chirping really, really loud, Yes. and flies down about 20 or 30 yards and back into the trees. 
and I do not know why, but I followed that bird and walked down in the direction where that bird had flown. And when I got down to about where the bird had flown back into the trees, it came out again and flew another 20, 30 yards around. And so I just kept following. And I followed it pretty much all the way around to the to the opposite side from where I was. Yes. And then it came out of the trees and flew straight across the cemetery. And I just started walking and about and that was in the the new section with the the uh, the brass plaques flat on the ground. Yes. And I just started walking across the across the cemetery in the direction that that bird had flown and about Five or six markers in, there he was. There he was. That bird took you to the grave. That bird led me to his grave. Uh huh. Yeah, I see why you winced a little bit at White Bird. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, and good night. Uh, so there you have it. Yes. There may be something about birds. On the um, the day my father died, uh, you may remember I was on the air full time at that point. On the day that my dad died, a bat flew on our porch. I mean, bats just don't do that. We've never, in all in all the days we've been here, it has never happened before. A bat just flew on our porch and wouldn't move. There was nothing apparently wrong with the bat at all. Nothing. He was fine. He just wouldn't move. And so we scooped him up, and, uh, you know, it's warm here in the summer, so we put him in a shady spot, and when night came, the bat just psh, left. But never, ever, ever has a bat just come to spend the day. That day, the day my father died, he did. That's a true story. Um, you're on the air on Ghost to Ghost AM. Good morning. Hello. Hi. How are you, Art? Just fine. What is your name? My name is Rob, and I live in the greater Detroit, Michigan area. Okay, Rob, welcome. And I listen to you on CKLW out of Windsor, Canada. Uh, absolute monster out of Windsor, yes. yes. It's good hearing your voice again. And yours. At least for the first time. Yeah. Um, my particular um, incident uh, happened uh, nearly, uh, well, it was 50 years ago. Um, I was a small child in uh, 1953. And um, I lived in the um, northern suburbs of Detroit at that point. Um, but in any event, uh, I was in my bedroom at the age of three, and I suddenly popped out of my bed, and uh, I was rather agitated and excited. And uh, I noticed in the corner of the room where the wall and the ceiling intersect, there was an apparition of a very seductive-looking woman. Ah. Uh-huh. Um, she didn't appear in full body, but uh, it was more like from the waist up. Uh, she had extremely pale skin, um, long black hair. She had a tight-fitting bustier on her. She was rather buxom. Um, I was just simply mesmerized by looking at her in an awe, and I stood there for a minute. And um, You were in immediate lust. Uh, something of that nature. <laughs> yeah, I um, in any event, um, I was just staring at her, and I don't remember her lips moving, but somehow she was communicating to me, and she was summoning me, and she said, Come here, blue eyes. Come here, blue eyes. Come oh. here. Oh. And I do have blue eyes. So I started to approach her. Uh, I took a step or two forward, and uh, I got towards the apparition as I saw it in the corner of the ceiling. And um, she said, stop to me. Uh huh. And uh, at that point, um, she went poof, and she disappeared. And simultaneously when that happened, um, I had a sharp pain in my left eye. 